All right, so I'm going to talk about the seven elements of positive communication and avoiding conversational traps. And my name's Heather Ross, and I had a daughter who struggled with addiction for the last nine years. So I've been through all of it, um, including, you know, the last 18 months, she was mostly sober, doing much better than she had um, ever done since her addiction started. But in December of last year, she relapsed and she was given fentanyl and she passed away. So my life has totally been changed and affected by addiction. And that's why I help other parents because just, I felt so alone early on and I struggled to find help, um, help that made sense to me and really resonated with my heart as a mom and seemed like it would work or help our situation. So I started helping other parents by hosting the living with addiction podcast. And I have a 12 week coaching program where I work one-on-one -on -one with other parents. And if you want to know, um, any more about any of that, you can go to heatherrosscoaching.com. And before I get into talking about the seven elements of positive communication, um, I just want to point out the order of the guide. Like I was thinking about it, <clears throat> how intentional that was on the part of the creators of the guide that we had all these steps leading up to communication that, you know, you start off by meeting your own needs and working on controlling your emotions because, you know, if you come into these conversations with this need to try and control your child or needing what you're going through to stop right away, you're going to bring this energy to the conversation. That's just going to make it not work. So anytime you need anything to change right away, you're going to be met with resistance from your child. So doing things in the order that they're presented in the book gives you the patience that you need to be able to approach these conversations. And, you know, just remembering that this is a marathon, not a sprint. This is a long-term investment and it's going to take a lot of practice. So I also want to point out that our brain processes, um, tone of voice, and body language before it processes words. So your child is going to pick up on that. Like if you are really uptight and gritting your teeth and you have, you know, a condescending tone in your voice, it does not matter what words you use because their brain is going to register that. And then they're just going to shut down and be defensive. So be really careful of that. Make sure that you are you know, uh, take some time to meditate or something to clear all that out before you go into doing one of these, you know, trying these steps. And also it's not, um, I just want to be careful, like don't get stuck in the trap of thinking that it's not working because your child's not sober yet. Like think of success in this area as just opening up to more conversation not yelling, like think of success more as change, because if you're only thinking of the outcome to be sobriety, then you're just always going to be frustrated until that happens. So the first element of positive communication is, um, number one is be brief. Don't over explain the reason that we over explain is because we're seeking our kids approval. So we want to be able to you know, express our opinions, but then we also want them to tell us it's okay. So if you find yourself like over explaining, just know that that's why, and maybe that will help you not to do that so much. The other part of it is, um, make sure you script what you're going to say. I always would like to write things down in my phone, like take notes for it, edit it, rehearse it. Like when I do these 10 minute talks, I write everything out that I want to talk about. And then I cut out like 75% of it because if I shared everything with you guys, like you wouldn't be paying attention to me anymore. You get sick of listening to me talk. So I just try to get down to what's most important. And that's, what's most important with keeping it brief with positive communication. And another thing is just saying it out loud. Cause you think about 
what this sounds like in my brain and then what it um, sounds like when it comes out of my mouth is totally different. And so I need to hear myself say it out loud a couple of times before I share it with you guys. Otherwise it's going to come out clunky, especially if you're nervous about it and worried about how it's going to be received, that will help you a lot. The second one is be specific. This one um, forces you to be really clear with your child. So if you're confused, then they're going to be confused and you need to be clear with saying something like, um, instead of saying like, I want you to be more responsible. I would say like specifically, that means I want you to be home on time in the next three weeks, I want you to get a job and I want you to do your chores. And then of course, being specific about what your chores are and when you expect them to be done. Number three is to be positive. And this is where you can put your reframing skills from the shame reframing skills that Beth talked about last week. So you can reframe what you don't want because you don't want to focus on I don't want you to do these things because then that comes off as critical and accusing and nobody responds well to that. So instead of saying like, don't be late, just say, be home by curfew. Or instead of saying, stop leaving your dishes in your room, then say, put your dishes in the dishwasher. And I just want to say to choose your words really carefully because the words we use are very powerful and we can either hurt or heal with our words. Number four, label your feelings. Keep your feelings in proportion to the situation. And then also remember that it's not what your child is doing that is causing your feelings. It's what you're thinking about it that's causing your feelings. And an example of keeping your feelings direct, but not over exaggerated would be so instead of saying like seeing you high is breaking my heart and it's destroying me, you could say like, I feel sad when you're high and I worry about you. Number five, offer an understanding statement. So trying to understand your child's behavior will really help them because like all we want us included is just to be seen and heard and understood. It's just this human need that we have. So saying something like, I know that you use substances because you get something out of it, or I recognize that quitting must be scary because it's hard can really go a long way for them to be feeling understood by you. And number six is take partial responsibility. When I was in Al-Anon, I can still remember the meeting where I heard like we all have 3% in any situation. And I was just so resistant to that at first when I heard it, because I was there for my ex-husband and I wanted it, you know, everything to be his fault. But when you can find your 3%, it really makes your child see that you are in this with them that you don't think that you're perfect and that you're willing to help them, which is number seven, offer to help. Just even simply asking, how can I help you? How can you remove any barriers to what they need? And another thing that I want to remind you about that one is that don't worry about enabling. Like this help is based on positive reinforcement. And now I just want to talk about avoiding conversational traps. So the first one is the information trap. And I know that this one is really tough because like, we just want them to understand, like if we could get them enough information and get them to understand, then they would see how bad that, you know, what they're doing is and that everything would be okay because they would want to stop. And this is like beating a dead horse. It just does not work. And we have to choose what we're going to say carefully and avoid constantly trying to convince them. Cause again, they just shut down to us. They don't hear anything that we say the lecture trap, which they also called, um, the deeper information trap. So it's just going even farther into the first information trap. And again, kids just shut down. I mean, it's like, we're just like verbally vomiting on them. Like nobody wants to be on the other side of that and the labeling trap, which I think can be particularly damaging because one labels come across as accusations and they lead to defensiveness. But when we label our kids, I think we really limit them. We 
you know, limit our relationship with them by the label. So if you think about your child has stolen from you and stealing is a behavior, but if you label them as a thief, how you think about them and how you act towards them is really going to change. So labels are going to limit your relationship and you just have to remember, like, take it down to, this is just a child. This is just your child and they're struggling. The blaming trap, like sometimes we feel this need to just get them to admit it, right? Like we need them to admit the truth that we know and accept responsibility. But the problem with that is that we're focusing on the problem and not the solution. So we just have to shift that around from blame to, you know, what's the solution to this? And then the last one is the question and answer trap, which is just like interrogating, you know, like you're an FBI agent or something again, like it's just going to shut your kid down. And I want to end by sharing that with patience. I mean, this takes a lot of patience. Again, this is a marathon, not a sprint and practice. Like you can get into a place in a relationship with your child where this isn't so much work. Like the stuff that Beth was just sharing, like that comes natural to her relationship with Joey because she's been practicing it for a long time. And so I like to think about it more like embodying these qualities instead of copying them. Of course, we're just going to copy them at first, but the game, the, the overall idea is to have this become a part of you rather than like, these are just the things I'm going to do until my kid gets sober. Like it's going to feel totally different to you. And I could talk to my daughter about anything as well, because I had invested so much time into building trust with her. We were really close. I mean, she would tell me things that I didn't necessarily even want to know, but I still just listened. But there was a time that her addiction and my reaction to it had really destroyed our relationship. And it was positive, loving communication that repaired our relationship. So no matter how hard this feels, it's, it's totally worth it because a big part of craft is the way you communicate in the words that you use. 